Payscope 2015 in Florida. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for coming out at 8.30 in the morning on a Monday to hear about SQL. Uh, before I begin, I have to put up the obligatory safe harbor statement. I'm not going to be talking about anything futures. In fact, I'm going to be talking about really, really old stuff. So don't worry, everything you hear actually exists. The way this presentation is going to work, there's two sections, an hour each. We're going to start very light and fluffy. Uh, a little bit of background on SQL, the database, and other things. Then we're going to get heavy into some SQL topics. And then we're going to finish up with technical topics, but things that aren't necessarily how to write SQL, but side effects of the fact that you're working with SQL. Uh, so, in the beginning, 1979, it would be eight more years before I wrote my first query uh, at this point in time, but version two of the database is released. Larry Ellison, being a pretty good marketing guy, said nobody buys version one of anything, so version two was the very first release. Uh, looking around the room, there's people sitting in here who were not alive when this historic event took place. I myself was about 14 years old, but you know, this is still a, a relatively new language. A couple years later, everything was rewritten in C. C was the new language at this point in time. It was like the Java of the 80s. It was the new kid on the block, but it was portable. Uh, it ran on many of the computers that were out there, and in fact, when they went to take Oracle and put it on a mainframe, they discovered mainframes don't have C compilers. So what did Oracle do? They wrote a C compiler to compile Oracle on the mainframe, rather than port Oracle to a different language. 1984, version 4 comes out, has perhaps my favorite feature of all time, read consistency. Version 3 introduced non-blocking reads. Version 4 gave us multi-versioning read consistency, uh, consistently correct answers, even if people were modifying information at the same time you were reading it. Here's the first version of Oracle I used. And in fact, here's the advertisement I used to purchase Oracle at that point in time. As you can see, it cost a whopping $199. And the competition back then wasn't IBM, it wasn't SQL Server, it wasn't Informix, it wasn't Sybase, it was DBase. We were talking about killing DBase at that point. How many people remember DBase, right? Wow, that's a lot, okay. <laughs> 1988, the first version of Oracle that many of us would actually recognize. This was an architectural rewrite. It was rewritten for a new computer architecture at that point in time, an SMP machine, having more than one CPU in a, in, in a box. At this point in time, there was a big discussion in the industry as to whether we're going to go with really big, really fast single CPU architectures, like a, a, a digital alpha from, from DAC, or if we were going to go with lots of little CPUs, like a, a sequent computer with lots of little 486 chips inside of it. Fortunately, the SMP architecture won out, and the Oracle architecture, a multi-process architecture at that point, uh, sort of became the, the standard, if you will, for building server software. Okay, so this is the version of Oracle that came out with DB Writer and Log Writer and everything else like that. 1992, I'm almost ready to join Oracle Corporation myself at this point in time. I'd come along about a year later, but version seven's released. And this was a pretty big release of uh, the database server. I mean, we had PL SQL in 1988, but we only had anonymous blocks. All of a sudden we had uh, stored procedures, we had triggers, we had uh, distributed computing, if you will. They called it cooperative server because client server was sort of the de facto industry standard for building applications at that point in time. And this was the first version of Oracle that really started to take off. Then there was 7.1, 7.2, 7.3 by the time we get to 1995. And I remember when version 7.3 came out, 
and I'm looking at the feature list, and it just kept on going and going and going. And I said, I better brush off my resume because we're done. I mean, what more can you put inside of this database? But frankly, if you made us go back to 1995, 20 years ago, can you believe it? Uh, it, it would be like stepping back into the dark ages. Remember, no stats pack even, no AWR, no ASH, util ESTAT, BSTAT, if you can remember those scripts, giving us a bunch of useless information that made us feel good about our databases, but didn't really help us make them go any faster. Uh, coming along into 8.0 and 8.i, so this is the right around the turn of the century, at the end of the 1990s, the internet is just starting to come out. Lots of features put into the database for building web-based applications. We're seeing the, the OWA, remember that? The Oracle Web Agent, HTF, HTP, lovingly handcrafted applications that you would write from scratch, starting with a PL SQL package, you know, to put out the HTML head tag all the way down to the, the slash HTML. Things have come quite far from that point in time. 9i, 10g, 11g, 12c, a lot about the, the DBA, a lot about making the database more self-managing. And it's good that we made the database a little bit more self-managing because frankly, for every self-managing feature we added, we probably added 15 more not self-managing features that the DBAs had to uh, worry about. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Oracle 9i, Larry Ellison would get up on stage and said, you, you won't need DBAs anymore. It's so self-managing. And I think he's made that claim with every release, and I think any DBA in the room would beg to differ with that analysis. So the next part's not going to be SQL so much. It's just uh, a look back at the time SQL was invented. If you can remember not even all of these things, but many of these things, then you were around when SQL was invented. <coughs> This is the phone that I had in my house. Remember, phones used to be bolted to the walls with cords, and you, you, if you wanted to talk to your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, you had to sort of sit around the corner and whisper because there was no place private to do it. Passbook savings accounts, remember? You, you used to have to go to the bank if you, really needed, if you needed money for the weekend. No ATMs. You had to get there before 2 o'clock in the afternoon because banks closed at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Passbook, take the money out. Space Invaders, right? Did you know the fact that Space Invaders speeds up as you kill more and more of the aliens was not a designed feature? They didn't plan it that way. It's just that the CPUs were so slow that by the time you got rid of many of the aliens, the graphics were able to print it faster. <laughs> so it was purely an accident that the game sped up at the end. Remember when you had to get up and walk across the room? to change the channel. I don't know how many times late at night I would watch a show I didn't want to be watching at a volume I couldn't hear it at because you just didn't want to get up and change the channel or adjust the volume. Some of my friends were lucky to have a remote control, if you remember this remote control, you know, by the, by the wire. But think about it, this is when SQL was just starting, and this is in our lifetime. There's 1983 with uh, the concept of, of a mobile phone. Uh, airmail, if you remember that, that was a big deal. You want it there overnight. You had special ways to do it. How many people remember a triple A trip tick? Right? You go there and they would actually cut up a map and make you a book. It was your GPS before GPS. You told them where you wanted to go and you got a flip over map that was specifically designed for you. Don't get lost because if you fell off the edge of the map, you know, you had to find your way back. Uh, everything in your cell phone is in this picture or this Radio Shack ad. And it's sort of sad because Radio Shack doesn't technically exist anymore. You know, this is what computers used to uh, look like. Stereo speakers the size of people, and this was considered a good idea at that point. Windows version 1. Anybody else use that? I had the pleasure of using that. The windows didn't even really overlap. They sat next to each other. Floppy disks. This is the kind of floppy disk Oracle version 5 came on. If you bought it for $199, you got about 13 or 14 of them. And it had everything, the database, forms, reports, and SQLnet 
Can you imagine that fitting on a couple of uh, 1.2 megabyte floppy disks? You know, uh, not today. Typewriters. I had a fancy typewriter though. You could type up almost an entire line of text before you hit enter, and so you didn't need whiteout because you could go back and correct it before you actually commit it to print. So getting back to SQL, I'm going to show you some things in SQL that you might not know or might not think you could write in SQL. My goal is not, specifically not, to say write everything in SQL. My goal is to say you could if you wanted to, but that would be a bad idea, right? There's many different languages out there, and we should use all of them for what they're best for. My point is a lot of people stop using SQL too soon. They say, oh, we can't do this in SQL. No, you can, and in fact, you should. And we should be taking SQL a lot further than we do. Uh, a while ago, I was at a conference, Moscow, doing a QA session, and somebody asked me the question, what I thought was the most underutilized feature in the database, and I thought about it for a second, and I said, SQL. SQL's the most underutilized feature. And they, they sort of laughed, because they said, we use SQL every single day. And I said, you use this much SQL. SQL is this big, right? And so there's a lot left on the table that we could be taking advantage of. So I, I participate in a, a forum. It's called Reddit. People post a lot of articles. And I subscribe to a lot of the technical ones. And just recently, somebody said, hey, I've got these interview questions, and they're programming questions. And there are five problems every software engineer should be able to solve in less than an hour. This caught my attention. I, I like interview questions. And, and the guy was a little bit uh, high on the hog about it. He says, if you can't solve these five problems in less than an hour, you may want to revisit your resume. The funny thing, though, was his problems got progressively harder, and his answers for numbers four and five were provably wrong. They had bugs in it. And he said, these are ridiculously simple. Ha, ha, ha. They were actually fairly complex. And I looked at him and said, can we solve these in SQL? So I went through them. And the first question was, I thought a bad question, because he's telling you how to do something. He should just be saying, I want you to sum a set of numbers. OK, I can do that in SQL. That's how we would do this in SQL. I generated a set of numbers, and I can select the sum of them. Right? But you asked specifically for while loops and recursion. We don't really have a while loop inside of SQL. But we do have an until, so I can use the model clause, and I can do some procedural programming here. I'm only going to return updated rows, the ones I'm actually uh, computing a value for, uh, sort of making a, a spreadsheet that is a spreadsheet that just has one cell in it. I can count up to 4.2 billion numbers in a list. If you have more than that, this won't work. Uh, I'd need a different query. But I can do the running total procedurally, even inside of SQL, and I get the answer. They also ask for recursion. Well, SQL can do recursion. So I generated the, uh, the two lists. Uh, so I'm selecting out the numbered items. And I'm going ahead and I'm using a recursive width subquery at this point. I called it summation. What I'm doing is I'm getting the first row from it. With the recursive width clause, this query will be fed into the union all branch. So I'm referencing myself inside of that query. So the first recursive iteration, I'm passing in the first row. I join that to the list, and I get the second row. And I add that up, then that gets fed in. The second row is joined to the third row, the third to the fourth, and so on. And at the end of the day, we get the summation. So we have sets. We have iteration. We have recursion. We, we have all of the concepts of pretty much any 3GL at this point. Here's problem two, getting a little bit harder. Take two lists, put them together, and alternate them. SQL is perfect for this. This was just a natural extension. So I took the first one, and I generated the set, but I assigned numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, odd numbers to it. I took the second list, added even numbers to it, union them together. And since they wanted a list as the output, used the built-in collect aggregate after sorting by the number I added to it. 
and voila, I get the, the list that they requested. This one got to be more interesting. Fibonacci numbers. This is a classic uh, sort of interview question. You think about this one for a while. If you just go with set-based stuff, this would be a little bit difficult to do because each row sort of depends on the prior two rows. And technically, there is no concept of a prior two sort of rows. But using the model clause in this case, we can do this. But one thing I'd like to point out is that the answer for the Fibonacci of 100 is 218 quintillion. Everybody who wrote procedural code to answer this got it wrong because that's bigger than a long long in C. That goes to 9 quintillion. It's bigger than the Java long type. If you wrote this in PHP, don't even think about what would happen because PHP user friendly would say, oh, your integer is an integer. Until we hit 9 quintillion, then apparently you obviously wanted to start using a 13 digit floating point number. Right? And so most of the procedural implementations people wrote wouldn't get the right answer. But Oracle with the number data type, we're, we're cool with 218 quintillion. That worked fine. And again, using the model clause, I created a spreadsheet, if you will, that had one cell in it. Then I iterate 100 times, so using some uh, procedural processing here, and said the Fibonacci of a given iteration number of a given row from 0 to 100, if the iteration number is less than 2, then by definition, the Fibonacci number is either 0 or 1, depending on if it's the first or the second. Otherwise, the Fibonacci of the current row, the iteration number, is equal to the Fibonacci number of the current row minus 2 plus the current row minus 1. So take the prior two rows after they've been computed. But it's recalculating just like a spreadsheet would. This one got to be even more interesting. Right? Given a list of numbers, pretend they're character strings, put them together in any way you can, and find the biggest number. This was uh, one of the implementations that they had a bug in the procedural code. A lot of people say, oh, we want to write procedural code, not SQL, because procedural code is more understandable. Right? I can read it. And procedural code reads like a book. Everybody can understand what it does until they don't. I can't tell you how many times over 22 years at Oracle, customers have given me procedural code and I've turned it into SQL, and when I tell them what the SQL does, they go, no, you missed the requirement entirely. I said, no, I took your code, and I'm doing exactly what it does. Our code doesn't do that. Yes, it does, and you have to go through and prove to them that given this data, this is the output you would actually get. I say, oh, didn't know that. But the procedural code is so much easier to understand than the SQL, right? Well, here's my approach to it. I take the list of numbers. I needed to make them unique. So I threw a string of x's onto the front of it. So this would create x50, xx2, xxx9, and so on. Once I did that, I put them together in all the unique combinations. So I would start with one of them, and I would join it to all of the rest using a connect by, creating all of the combinations. Uh, that generated a set that would look like this. So here's 50 at the start with all of the different permutations of the other numbers there. Once I had all of these strings, just get rid of the commas and the x's, turn it into a number, give me the max. Right? Very sort of simple operation. Again, I'm not saying SQL is the best way to approach this. For me, it would be, because I sort of think in SQL at, at times. I, I think I dream in SQL uh, occasionally. But uh, you can do this. And what I liked was all of my answers were one line of code. Nobody else could claim that with the procedural implementations. This was perhaps the trickiest one. You have the numbers 1 through 9, and you can put in between any of these elements either nothing or a plus or a minus, and find all of the strings that equal 100. This one took a little bit more work, OK? So the query's a little bit longer. But stepping through it, Everything's set-based. I knew I needed lots of pluses and minuses because I wanted to stick it to the string, so I took the plus and the minus, Cartesian joined it together, and I got all of the combinations of pluses and minuses possible. So I start with this. Then I take the numbers, 
and I start building all of the possible <coughs> substrings. Like I could have 1 plus 2, I could have 12 plus 3, I could have 123 plus 4, and so on. So I built all of the possible numbers starting with 1, all with 2, all with 3, all with 4, and so on. Now all I need to do is put them all together in every possible combination. So I built one with a whole bunch of spaces up to nine, and then one up to 89, and so on. So I have all the possible strings with the spaces in it. Now I just sort of need to stick pluses and minuses in there. I've got those from the prior operation. So I go ahead and do that. Lots of Cartesian joins. You know, a lot of people think Cartesian joins, anytime you have that, that's a bug. Well, it's a nice set operation sometimes. I'm using connect by in strange ways to pull information together uh, into an organization you wouldn't normally think of, Cartesian joins to put the stuff together. Once I have this, I use a trick that I use frequently to turn a string into rows. And so I can do that with a cast multi-set. I take the string and I sort of, uh, just using the dual table, figuring out how many rows I want to turn it into. And in this case, I'm turning it into the number of rows based on the spaces inside of it. And what I end up with is instead of this one single row, I take this and I turned it into something that goes down the page. So I've got a set again. And I did that again with 1, 2, 3, 456, 7, 8, 9. It's going down, I've got my pluses and minuses over here, I've got an index into the pluses and minuses, and I've got the original number. Now I can just use a group by, right? So I can sum those guys up based on uh, the pluses and the minuses, deciding whether to multiply by a, a positive one or a negative one, anytime it equals to 100, pump out the answer. So this was something you can do in SQL, again, probably not the best language to implement this, but given any problem, I'm hard pressed nowadays with version 12, actually since version 10 with the model clause, to say, oh, I don't think we can do that in SQL, right? Here's another set of interview questions. This was on Ask Tom a while ago. Uh, what is the best way to name all of the numbers from one to 100 which have the letter A in their spellings? And so this, again, is another procedural uh, sort of interview question. And my answer was, we just need dual. Let me generate 100 numbers, and I can easily spell them, because I know that uh, we support Julian dates, and you can spell Julian dates. And so I get one, two, three. And once I have that, I just have to say where it's like 8%. It became pretty easy. Now, what are all the characters in A through Z that do not appear? This gets a little bit more complicated, but it's still solvable in SQL. Generate all of those numbers. I'm turning it, I'm using that trick again so that I'm making it spell down the page. I turned all the letters into a set. Once I have all of those letters, I can get the distinct ones. I now have all the letters that appear in one through 100. But the question was, does not appear? Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and use a little bit of a, uh, list ag to put it back into a string, so there's the letters that appear, and then I can just translate the alphabet using that list ag, getting rid of the characters that appear in the translation string, and here's all the letters in the alphabet that are left over afterwards. You can think strangely with this. Here's my set of interview questions. So anybody who's ever interviewed, uh, Tyler Muth is sitting here in the, in the front, he had these questions, what, 1996, 2000, okay? So it's pretty easy. Scott.emp, tell me the number of records in this table, number of records in this table by the month of the hire date. For bonus points, tell me why my question is, is horribly phrased, it's, it's semantically incorrect, and display the month with the most records, the most popular month. And as a bonus to this, please tell me why this question is a bad question as well. So, number of records is pretty easy. You'd be surprised though how many people choke. They're like thinking, it's gotta be harder than this. It's gotta be harder than this. It can't just be count, right? But if you can get past this, the next one gets a little bit easier. You know, let's just do the higher date, convert it to a month, count. But is this the right answer? We have one, two, where's three? Four, five, six, seven, eight, we're missing 
9, 10 is, is gone. So this technically wasn't the right answer. People would give this one all the time, and I'd just sit there and say, well, you're close. Can you make it be the real answer, which is all of the months? I need to see zeros inside of here. Well, we just need to generate some data. You could use any table. Uh, they could have used all objects to get 12 rows or whatever. But as soon as we have those, we now have the ability to do an outer join, either using the NC syntax or Oracle syntax. Right? And you get the, the right result set with this one. And then the last one, the most frequently occurring month. This is the one I like to talk about because almost nobody could write this query under that sort of pressure in an interview situation. But the, the problem with that question is you're not thinking in sets. There might not be a most popular month. There are the most popular months. And you have to accommodate for that in SQL. Like uh, if you ever wrote a query to show the top three performing salespersons in your company, wouldn't you be disappointed if you were the fourth salesperson who sold exactly as much as the previous three? but because the developer just said, oh, we'll order by sales and pull off the first three records and print them. These guys get to go on the special trip or they get a bonus or something like that. Right? You have to be thinking about these nuances when dealing with the data. But here's a, an ANSI SQL way of, of doing it. Not many people know that you can just say having a count star equal, give me the select of the max count star. And that would get the set of months with the most frequently occurring month. I could also use rank ranking functions if I was in Oracle 8i and above to do this. I could also write it in a variety. I mean, there were dozens of ways to answer this. A lot of people would choke on this one. Ah, this is a, a, a relatively new one, version 12 with the fetch first. But you have to know to say fetch first one rows with ties. So even though this says fetch first one rows, this query could return a million records because of the with ties. Anybody know what this query does? Sure. I just saw this one recently. I mean, you, 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 oh, well, you might, well, it was submitted to your website. You didn't personally review all of these. So this is a little bit of a puchicated SQL. You run this particular SQL statement, and of course, it generates the Mona Lisa. Right? I did not write this one, by the way. It was uh, Rob Van Wick, uh, you know, coming along, writing some interesting SQL. But it's interesting to know that just using the table dual, you can generate fine works of, of art. Right? <laughs> now, getting into the SQL stuff, NoSQL, which really did start out as not only SQL, I mean, it didn't start that way. It started as no SQL. We don't like SQL. We don't need SQL. SQL stinks. SQL is the old legacy language. We obviously need a new language. Well, I'd like to ask you a question. What was SQL invented to replace? Why do we have SQL today? It was invented to replace no SQL. Before there was SQL, there was no SQL. Literally, vSAM anyone? Anybody program using vSAM? What was it? It was a keyed read. Give me a key, I'll give you a value. And what was in that value? Typically more keys that we could then navigate to the other records. Oh, we're programming our own joins and things like that. And that was deemed relatively inflexible. So vSAM, IMS, IDMS, networked hierarchical databases and everything else. In fact, the whole three-tier architecture that everybody says is is new, was invented this century, and is sort of a, a really cool new thing, is something we were doing in the 1970s and 80s. We had CICS in the middle, that was our application server. We had ISPF green screen panels in the terminal. That was our web browser. You tab from field to field, fill them in, hit the enter key, F8 actually, to submit the form. That go to the middle tier, goes to a database, did a transaction, gave us another screen back. Right? And so the technologies we're using today are really technologies we were using 30, 40 years ago. NoSQL is not here to replace SQL. SQL is not going to replace NoSQL. They both make sense in different places. And in fact, the people who sort of invented the NoSQL stuff are coming around and saying, maybe this language doesn't suck so bad. 
right? There are some advantages to it because we could sit down and interrogate our data, look at it from this direction, look at it from that direction, right? If you have a document store and you put in customers with accounts, with transactions, and you want to take a look at uh, the number of transactions you had performed today, you'd have to go out to every single customer document and say, did you do any transactions at this point? If it's in relational tables, or at least in something that looks like a relational table, you could come at it from transactions back to accounts to customers. You could go accounts to customers. You could go accounts to transactions. You could come in from customers to accounts to transactions. You can look at the data any which way you want to. And that's sort of the power of SQL. So let's get into some of the SQL capabilities that are in there in the, in the database. Analytics, introduced in Oracle 8i. A surprising number of people still have not used it, even though this stuff has been around for almost 20 years at this point in time. I remember in about the year 2000, I sort of discovered analytics for the first time. And all of a sudden, it became the answer to almost every query on Ask Tom for like years. And I would just say, analytics rock and roll. Because you could start doing things by looking up and down in a result set instead of just left and right. So in the past, we just had tuples. We, we, we had rows. We had information. There was no such thing as a first row or a last row or a previous row or a next row. But all of a sudden, with analytics, we had the ability to virtually break the data up I want to do something by department. After I break it up, I want you to sort this information. So now the rows have order all of a sudden. So order by salary from big to small. Then apply a function to it. And this function would give me the numbers one, two, three. And the really cool thing with the analytics is as we go from group to group, the analytics reset. So it's not like row none, which would just go and go and go. Although. Some of our customers have really big tables now, and they've discovered that Ronum goes and goes and goes till 4.2 billion. Then it goes back around. Right? Because when they invented Ronum in the 1980s, they weren't thinking billions of rows. A million row table was big back then. Right? And so we're starting to hit some of the size implications in our, in our data sets. But here, it resets. And you can see now how easy it would be to get the first three by department. And we can do lots of things, running totals, percentages in groups, top end queries, ranking queries, medians, and, and so on. So here's a, a question. In SQL, find the average amount of time between patient visits. Think about this. You have a, you have a patient file, patient ID, visit date. What do I need to do? I need to take the current record for a given patient, and I need to find the record for that patient that is the record with the maximum visit date that's less than my visit date. There's quite a few different ways to write this SQL. Don't know about analytics? You might do it in a pure set-based way, and the performance of that would be a little bit questionable. So what I did was I generated some patient visits, maximum 250 patient visits per patient, uh, primary key of patient ID and the visit date. And here's the standard SQL, if you will, the database independent SQL, the SQL that would work on any database out there, the SQL you might write if you never got past, you have select from, where, group by, order by, and so on, right? None of the in-depth features. I go to the patients table, and I'm going to join it to itself. And I'm going to join it by patient ID, but I need the maximum date that's less than my date. So when I join by patient ID, I'm going to join every patient record with all of the rest of my records, but only keep the ones where the visit date for the second table was less than the visit date of the first. I want to keep the maximum one of those. Then I just need to subtract those two and take the average, and voila, I get the answer. This query is why big data databases were invented. Because you run this guy, and it's going to take a really long time. I just did it for 90,000 records. And we generated an intermediate result set of 11 million records. Take that up by three or four orders of magnitude. This is the query that never finishes. And this is the query that people go, SQL's too slow. 
we need a thousand cores and massively parallel processing, and then we can attack this problem. We got to shard it across 500 machines and just throw lots of Java threads at it. So you try to rewrite it a different way. You send it to your friend for some tuning. And they say, ah, indexes. We need to use indexes, because indexes are fast. So we'll just make one pass on the patient's visit table. We'll run a correlated subquery for that patient ID, get the maximum visit date, subtract the two, and voila. We're, we're not going to have that Cartesian join anymore. What we're going to have, though, is something you could use to heat your house in the winter in Alaska with, because this just is going to eat CPU. Every single row that comes out of that full scan is going to do an index range scan. This is just 90,000 rows. Imagine 9 billion rows, right? That fan is still spinning uh, on the back of that computer. So this isn't a scalable way to do this either. So let's take a look at analytics. What did I want? I wanted the previous row's visit date after breaking the data up by patient ID and ordering by visit date. I just used lag. I'm making a single pass against the data. I'm not using any indexes to look up stuff. I get the same information. I get the same answer. But he uses slightly less resources, right? So this is going to scale to much larger data sets than using, say, the mini Cartesian join, using the index range scan over and over again. Using analytics, you can usually get in a single pass against the data the answer you're looking for. And that's, that's the goal with SQL, is to reduce the number of passes. If you, if you see somebody joining the table with itself over and over again, be suspicious of that query. Take that query, ask them, what are you trying to do? That's another just piece of advice. Don't try to tune somebody else's query. It will sort of warp your mind. Just pretend you didn't see it and say, what was the question? Right? And just come up with a brand new query to answer that. The model clause. This is the one that hurts people's heads. OK, this came out 2003. How many people use spreadsheets? How many people are pretty good with Excel? How many people use the model clause? Well, the people using the model clause are not the Excel users, but they should be. If you can create a spreadsheet with formulas inside of it, and you can understand how that spreadsheet works, you can use the model clause. The syntax is a little bit different, but the concept's identical. It's just a big, infinitely sized spreadsheet recalculation that's taking place. Okay, so if you just Think concept spreadsheet inside of SQL, the model clause might be something to look at. Here's a question. I need to have running totals to group rows into groups such that the total for that group does not exceed some threshold, meaning I have this column here that I'm going to sum up in a running total. It's going to be ordered by this site column. I have a threshold of 65,000, so I'm going to take 10,000 plus 20,000. That's 30,000 plus 30,500 is 60,500. If I added 50,000 to that, it would exceed my threshold. Therefore, the first three rows are my group. The fourth row is a group by itself. Fifth and sixth are a group, and so on. Almost like a bin fitting problem. You can actually do bin fitting problems inside of SQL, like optimize how to put these boxes into bigger boxes for shipping and so on, because we have this procedural code. So let's take a look at the model clause. You're not going to know how to write a model clause query unless you already do when you leave here today. But hopefully, you just get interested enough to take a peek at it. Here's the query. We'll go through it sort of step by step. We have our original input data set. We're going to add to this a dimension, something that's running down the side of the spreadsheet, if you will. This could be an attribute that already exists in the data set, or in this case, we're synthesizing one using row number. So we really just have row numbers going down, and we have some measures going across. These are our, the columns of our spreadsheet. Now, in my output data set, these three columns, end site, count, and row num, they're just inherited down. So this site column is reproduced in its entirety here. This count column is reproduced in its entirety here. That RN column is the row number. The only real columns that we're computing are what I'm calling start site and this running total 
and we have rules for those. That's how we can see that these are these derived columns. And we have rules for the running total column when row num is greater than one, and when the start site, when the row num is greater than one. So for that first row there, everything just comes down from the original input set. Because Rn is not greater than one, so these rules aren't run, and we get a starting site of 1,001 equal to the end site, the count and the running total are equal, and the Rn is just inherited down. It gets interesting when we go to row two, because all of a sudden, Rn is greater than one, and when Rn is greater than one, we're gonna run those formulas, and we're gonna say when the when the running total for the current row minus one, so we take the 10,000, plus the count of the current row, that's the 20,000, is greater than 65,000, that's not true. Or the count of the current row is greater than 65,000, that's not true. So we go to the else. The, the answer is gonna be the running total of the previous row plus the count of the current row. 10,000 plus 20,000 is 30,000. We have similar logic for figuring out what the starting site's gonna be. This is gonna turn into our grouping column. What we're gonna do is generate this running total until it exceeds our threshold. When it exceeds our threshold, we're gonna reset our counters. Isn't this exactly what you would do in procedural code if you were processing this? You'd read the data back, sort it, and you would say if the count plus the current row's count exceeds the threshold, then output the, the row, reset the counters, and start adding up again. This is exactly what we're doing in this spreadsheet. So we go to the third row. Well, the previous row, 30,000 plus 30,500, does not exceed the threshold, so the running total is just the previous row's running total plus the current row's count, 60,500, and we carry the site down. Get to row four, this is where it gets interesting because all of a sudden if we add those two numbers together that does exceed our threshold, we reset our counters. So all of a sudden the running total is just count of the current row. It's not the addition of the previous row plus the current row. We reset our counter and we reset our site as well. We mark the beginning of our new group. We go to the next row, row five, and if we add the 50,000 and 25,000, exceeds our threshold, reset the counters again, reset the group. And once we have this, getting the ultimate answer is pretty easy because we have this nice column we can group on. We select the uh, maximum end site, so we get the starting site, the ending site, and we take the maximum running total, and you have your answer, right? And so even though it looks a little bit intimidating, when you break it down, it makes it fairly easy to understand. Of course, once you know you can do that, you could obviously use SQL now to solve any Sudoku puzzle, right? Because you just give the input of all of the numbers that's in the puzzle. Using just the table dual, it will go through and compute all of the missing numbers for you. Again, you probably wouldn't use SQL to do this, but you could if you wanted to. And in fact, uh, this query was written by this guy in uh, Anton Sheffer when version 10 came out. When version 12, or gosh, I can't remember my feature by releases anymore. We're recursive with subqueries, version 11. Uh, he rewrote it as a recursive with subquery so you could take this puzzle, send it to this slightly smaller SQL statement, and it would solve it as well in SQL. Pattern matching. This is a new one in version 12. With pattern matching, we can do some interesting things that you can't with analytics. Analytics, they make it sound like you could do pretty much anything you wanted. The model clause, pretty much anything you wanted to do. They get us maybe 95% of the way there. There's another class of questions that they're not really ideal for looking at. With the model clause, with analytics, we can look backwards and forwards in a result set, but you have to know how far back and how far forward you want to look. How big is your pattern that you're going to look for across these rows? So with the pattern matching, we can take a data set, segment it by some attribute, partition it, order it by some attribute, and then start to look for a pattern inside of there. So a pattern we might want to look for is uh, grouping a series of audit trail records together based on how close they are to each other. So th think of a web log, for example. I go to get index.html, that's going to get a.gif, b.gif, c.jpg, and so on. It's going to generate a lot of requests all really close to each other. 
all of those requests represent one real page get, right? I want to take my web log and segment it by user ID, and any time the previous record is within, say, three seconds of the current record, that's one request. When those request times get to be more than three seconds apart, I want to change groups and start a new request. How big is that pattern going to be? No idea. It could be 10 rows. It could be 10,000 rows. Now, I can do this with analytics. It requires lots of passes against the data, though. I can do this with vanilla SQL, just using ANSI 89, going all the way back to the beginning, SQL. I can do it in a single pass with pattern matching. So let's create some data. I'm going to put a date and some number that I want to sum up in there. Here are the groups that I want out of this. All of these timestamps are within three seconds. Then all of a sudden, this one gets to be six seconds more. So this is a new group. And then this one is 16 seconds more. So that's the new group. So these are the three groups that I want to generate. Here's the ANSI SQL. I even forget how I generated this. It was, it, it, it was not an easy query to write. But it gives you the answer. Here's how we can do it with analytics. I'm going to take the original data set. And I'm going to get the previous row's x value in addition to the current row's x value. And I'm also going to mark the rows where the timestamps exceed three seconds different. And so the output of this will be nothing up here. So there's nothing marking this group. But the beginning of the second group is marked by row number 11, the beginning of the third group by 14. Now I can take that and using another layer of analytics, I can carry that value down. So now I end up with a set of data that looks like this. The first group just has a null group identifier. This has all 11s, all 14s. And then I can make my third pass against this data. And I can aggregate it up. And I get the answer that I wanted. Here's the pattern matching query that I can use against this. So we select any set of data. In this case, I'm going to use this match recognize clause to first sort the data by some attribute. I could also partition it. I don't have anything to partition by in this case. I'm going to look for this pattern. I want to find a pattern that is any row followed by another row within three seconds with an asterisk after it. This is sort of like a regular expression. Oracle doesn't know what any row means. It doesn't know what another row within three seconds means. Those are made up names. I created those. They're just correlation names. Down here, I have a definition section where I can tell Oracle about these. Now, since I don't have a definition for any row, that means any row could match it. No definition. The definition is true. So this just says you could find any row, and that's the beginning of a pattern. As long as it's followed by another row within three seconds, zero, one, or more times. Okay? Another row within th three seconds has a definition. It's just defined as the current row's x minus the previous row's x is less than three seconds. So it goes through this data set, and it gives me the same exact answer. I'm going to use it as an aggregate, one row per match. I could say all rows per match, but that would just give me the original input data set again. So I'm using this to aggregate. It's doing this in one pass again. After match, or the measures that I want out, I want the first timestamp, the last timestamp, and the sum of that y value. So that's just like using the min and the max and uh, the, the sum aggregate built in. After the match, skip past the last row. So as you're going through this data set and you find a pattern, you take all those rows, turn them into a single row, start looking for the next pattern after the end of that first pattern. We could start looking for the patterns any place in the result set that we actually want to. Here's the performance of these queries. So this is the ANSI SQL. It took a little bit of time for this one to run. It created lots of mini Cartesian joins in order to do this, because we had to find the maximum previous record and so on. So it was a little bit like the, the patient visit uh, problem. Here was the analytic query, much better, order of magnitude better. But you know, it had to process and reprocess data. Getting to the pattern matching, we're able to do this in a single pass against the data. Right? We still have some sorting and buffering to take place, but we don't have to 
read it, write it to temp, read it in, write it to temp again, read it in, write it to temp, and then send the answer back to the client. External tables. This is the data loading tool for the 21st century. If you're still using SQL Loader, I'm afraid to say that you're using a 20th century data loading tool. With an external table, you can do things that are just physically not possible with SQL Loader. Have you ever tried to use an or in SQL Loader? I want to load this record if this column equals this or this or this or this. If you've ever tried to do that, you've found that you have to use multiple into clauses over and over again, and you're basically processing and reprocessing records. Well, if I use an external table, which allows me to query flat files, I can do things like, say, where column in. I can join to other tables. I can do some constraint checking. I can look for bad records. I could use a multi-table insert to put good records in one place, bad records in another. I could use the error logging clause to create the equivalent of bad files inside of uh, the database and so on. You can also query data pump format files. This is pretty powerful. You can do a create table of select organization external, and that will create a file. So you can actually unload data using any arbitrary SQL query, join, sorts, anything you want, pick up that file, plop it on another database, and start selecting from it. With 10.2.5 and above, you can query the output of programs. This gets to be really interesting all of a sudden. You got a gzip compressed file, you could read the output of g unzip. You're not gonna read the compressed file, you're not gonna decompress the, the compressed file to disk, you're going to run G unzip against it, decompress it to standard out, and the external table will be able to read and process that as if it was a flat file in the file system. But you can also query other things like LS, PL SQL. Stephen's going to be talking about that ad nauseum later this, this afternoon. It can read files, it can write files, it can rename files, it can erase files. What can it do with files, though? It can't tell you what files are there. There is no, give me a list of files in this directory. But I have ls, ls can tell me that. I can read the output of a program. ls is a program, it writes the standard out. I can select star from ls, pf, df, and so on. And in version 12, all of a sudden, we can start querying big data sources as well. But let's take a look at an external table example. I'm using the preprocessor because this is not only really cool, but it's very useful. One of the reasons people didn't want to use an external table when it first came out was, oh, I can't cat a gzip file to a named pipe and then load from the named pipe. I have to decompress the entire file. Now I don't have to. What I have is a compressed file in the file system. I have this little script that uncompresses whatever file I tell it to to standard out, and I can now select star from it, and I get that information. It's never been decompressed onto disk anywhere. I can also read the output of an arbitrary program. So here I'm using df to give me uh, some information about the file system. DBA asked me the question, how can I find out what data files in my database are on volumes in the file system such that that data file cannot grow by 20%, right? So the volume is not big enough to allow that file to expand. If you gave that problem to a developer, what would they do? Undoubtedly, they would connect to the database, query DBA data files, pull all the stuff back, and then they'd query the file system, and they'd join it together, and they'd print you a report. Now, what do you got to do to run that program? Oh, I got to log into that machine, and then I got to run out against that database and run it against that database. I, I need to figure out how I'm going to manage passwords passing to this thing because I don't want them on the command line and because people can PS it and stuff like that. So wouldn't it be easier if we could just log into the database and select from a query and get this answer? Because I'm already logged in. The password's not a problem. I don't have to be on the machine. I could actually automate this as a job that would run the report and then you'll mail it to me on a recurring basis. So if I put it in the database, I can do some interesting things. So I create a DF table. I can now select star from DF 
but how do I join this? Because I have a file system name here. I need to join it to DBA data files. But you know, I could have a slash u, slash u, slash x, slash u, slash x, slash y. I need to find the mount point that is the longest mount point that matches most of the leading part of my DBA data file name. I have to use sort of a funky join. So I'm gonna use analytics. I'm joining with a like. This should be okay as long as I don't have hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of data files. But this is gonna perform adequately. But once I do this, I can join those together. And using those analytics, I can look for my 20% printed out. But this is an interesting implementation with the external table. Start thinking outside the box. Don't think, what can't I do in SQL? Start thinking, what can I do? Right? And take it to an illogical extreme sometimes, if you will. But I find if you put it into the database, it's there for everybody. And you know, it'll be there 20 years from now. I know that for a fact because I've got some stuff that's in databases that's still here from 20 years ago. Right? And it's gone through, uh, character mode forms, GUI forms, the PL SQL Web Toolkit, Java version one, Java version two, Java version 200, Java version 1000, right? The same piece of code can be reused over and over again. And as I said, in version 12, we can start to do some interesting things with big data, if you will, inside the database. So I can connect to a uh, Hadoop distributed file system and start querying the, basically the output of MapReduce programs as though they were row sources themselves. And if I have a big data machine, I can actually do exadata-like processing. And this is all done with external tables. We'll import the metadata, create a series of external tables. That's just creating the external tables for us, automating that event. You can also create them manually against any arbitrary HDFS uh, implementation. And then that will give us the ability in a big data machine uh, to do exadata-like processing against these no data, no SQL data sources. So it can push the where clause down and just return the columns and rows of interest back to the database server, uh, which really gives us the ability with SQL to query any data where it exists, right? And so I can take Hadoop, a NoSQL implementation. This might have some JSON documents inside of it. We can push down the request to the NoSQL database, have the JSON parsing take place there, and we can actually join data from here to here to here. Pull it all together, analyze it using SQL. Unintentionally, I brought us to 9.30, which is the first break, and I'm at a great place to stop. When we come back, We'll start, pick up with my favorite Oracle feature of all time. Not really SQL, but a side effect of using SQL. So hopefully I'll see a couple of you in 15 minutes.